Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lost Dudes of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover. And right now, we need to talk about speaking softly. So, Herr Schmidt, I read about your plan. Speer looked up from his desk, his eyes meeting his foreign ministers. I'd like you to explain it to me more, because frankly, I don't understand why we need to go to this much effort over a place like Poland. Schmidt straightened his tie. It's less about Poland itself than more about the international effects, my big daddy. Speer leaned back in his chair. Elaborate. Well... We could enforce our will through force of arms on the Poles, as we did in the 30s, but the main issue is that internationally, this would threaten our image as a reformist gentler Reich. The issue with your plan, Herr Schmidt, is that it's going to force us into promises we might not be able to keep. I understand my plan is not perfect, but it is the only way to keep our image safe. Besides, negotiations means no bloodshed, and neither of us want that, do we, Schmidt smiled? No, of course not. I'll give you permission to go ahead. Don't screw this up for me, will you? Speer shuffled in his chair. Schmidt nodded before leaving the room, the hopes of the Reich's new standing resting squarely on his shoulders. We'll see how this goes. Now, I went back in time, as you can tell. It's now August 27th, 1965, and we're doing no exceptions again, which we got last time, but because, um, like, this is the only time we can get above 75% regime stability, I decided, you know what, just blow through this one f real fast, and once we have it unlocked, we can just move on, and we should, should be able to get this one done. It's, we got quite a few days left, but we'll see what happens. Um, a couple comments. Someone recommends we use console commands. Uh, so someone also says when we play as Goring, don't call your allies in, which we probably won't. And then, yeah, doing this vast political promises thing. Someone keeps saying that don't do it. Well, there's honestly no other way for us to get this done without doing vast political promises. If you know how to do it without using vast political promises, please let me know because I literally don't know any other way we can do this without using vast political promises. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through this. We're going to get all the stuff that we did at yesterday's video done. We'll reconvene once we are getting close to the Schwert des Damocles. But we'll also have to go through other countries first, such as Ukraine, Russia, um, what was this? Brittany is not in faction, so probably Brittany, as well as the Caucasus. So I'll see you in just a little bit. Alright, everyone. So now a telegram to Warsaw. Now, technically, I've already completed it, but we haven't read through this one yet. To begin with, Reichsminister Schmidt has decreed that the Reichsamts des Auswärtigen prepare a telegram that will be sent to the Polish government in Warsaw. Schmidt, seeking to establish diplomatic cordiality between Poland and the GGR, desires to make clear his intention to pursue an earnest a diplomatic relationship with his former contemporaries, hoping to spur cordiality and encourage negotiation with the recently liberated. And which will probably do the Germans of the Vistula. We cannot allow, or cannot, and most certainly will not, abandon the few German settlers who have found themselves within the borders of the former general government. Reichs Minister Schmidt, seeking to protect the rights of these expatriate German nationals, has concluded that it is best we negotiate with the Polish government with regard to the matter of these citizens. Indeed, it is hoped that Schmidt's cordiality and charisma should convince the Poles to grant this Germanic minority the same rights and freedoms allotted to the ethnic Polish majority. So, right now, we've really got to beeline for uh, more stability. You know, I'll be honest here, like, I've done this, I've reloaded this save, like, at least 25 to 30 times, quite literally, just to make sure that we can get both the Reich's Minister's plan, as well as no exceptions done, without using consequences so far, but rinsing out evil. A burst of static filled the screen, before cutting to a man clad in black armor, holding a rifle in one hand and a flag in another. Stepping forward, he raised the flag and showed the old symbol of Germany, planting it in front of his feet. As he did, he took a step back and glanced at the flag, looking at it with curiosity. Then, curiosity turned into hostility, which then turned into laughter. Shaking his head, the man merely gripped his rifle with both hands and pointed at the flag, pulling the trigger. Gunfire erupted, and once he stopped, the camera panned back to the pole as the German flag fell in cold, dead silence. A few seconds passed before another flag was lifted in its place. Pure black, with a black sun, Oldenstadt burgund. The camera panned backwards as cruel laughter echoed again and again. Ruined buildings and city blocks was all that there was to see. Covering the entire span of the camera in smoke and destruction, it continued for almost a dozen seconds. Before the camera switched yet again, this time, it was a clean streets of Germany proper. A young, healthily looking man, dressed in the colors of the Wehrmacht, was playing with two children, happily ruffling their hair and playing short games with them in the distance. Their parents watched, their faces improving, and their smiles bright. As this was going on, a voice began speaking. We must avoid the mistakes of the past that have led to cruelty. Yesterday. Blood filled the streets in Germany today. Peace reigns from our homes to the forests and the mountains. Tomorrow, we shall have an ethical Wehrmacht, one that will be incapable of committing the horrors that Germany was forced to follow in the past. Finally, the soldier bids the parents and the children farewell, and they will amicably part ways. Do your part to make Germany's armed forces a more humane place. And right now, we're doing the great game for Romania. Cool, and we're at 38%, which is not good. We're about done holding a speech as well. Uh, we'll get up to around 40%, even though it continues to decay every single time, which really, really sucks. And anything else, we're still doing some stuff over here, so. 
Oh, and there we go. Uh, the Germans are the Vistula. Anyone keep an eye for the uh, intelligence agency stuff? The resistance below. Schmidt has managed to carry himself through the negotiations, and now we've gotten ourselves to the point about the Polish resistance. It seems that the Polish Home Army's status is of great concern. There are talks about whether to disarm them or not. Some have suggested that their leaders be put on trial, but we must see how this goes to play out as well. And right now, uh, we've already done the whole awesome thing, so. Zebel is back. And actually, we have the two other options here, which means... Ah, this would be really good to do. We literally can't do this one. Oh, maybe I should have waited to do this one. Uh, maybe I should have, I should have maybe waited to do that one, maybe. Because that's actually really good to do. So, 5 and 1 for Romania now. Mm, we'll do, oh, I don't want to lose political power, but a step towards the future. The news passed through the foreign ministry's hands quickly. A fast track to two offices, Helmut Schmidt and Albert Speers. The message read like a celebration the Poles had, after much consideration and debate, accepted talks with Schmidt. Together, they wrote. They hoped that Poland and Germany would work together to take Europe into an ascendant future. These talks bring the groundwork to lay such a foundation. Of course, it was all diplomatic flattery for now. Nobody would dare to be brutally honest this early, but it was enough for Germany, and was certainly enough for Schmidt und Speer. In the Big Daddy's office, Albert read the letter with a sigh of relief as he took a drink. Worries danced in his mind. What if they forced the Reich's hand? What if Schmidt promised the stars and the sun, but he sidelined them for now? For now, though, things were moving quite along smoothly. Speer had to admit, despite his personal dislike of Schmidt, he got things done. In Schmidt's office, Helmut took the joys uh, joyously, the news joyously. He had expected to accept, expected them to accept, but it actually happening gave him an opening. With the cooperation of the Poles, he could help set things right once and for all, and Europe would be one step closer to the light. The hopes of Poland rest uneasy. Now, the, now a lot of the decisions here, the events, will literally lower our regime stability. So I might actually go back and do it once again, reload another save off screen, do this one first, and then do the stuff with the Poles, just because this is actually really, really good to get. Uh, and I might not even do the Austin stuff yet then. Hmm, we'll see what happens. Resistance below. Followed up with Slaves of the Reich. Foreign Minister Schmidt is making moves to kickstart negotiations regarding the fated Polish slaves living in the Reich. It is in his mind that they must be returned to Poland with all their freedoms restored. This will be an interesting endeavor, which we hope would succeed. We will have to see how this plays out. Alright. Uh, we can do that one again, but we're not going to do it right now. Yeah. No thanks. This one literally just gives you plus 10 and plus minus 10, so... Uh... What else do we have? Anything down here yet? No, it sucks. But the tension between the two delegations lay thick and heavy in the conference room. Schmidt's eyes nervously dotted across the faces of the Polish negotiators, settling finally on their head. One, Stanislaw Wachowiak. Wachowiak's eyes bored straight into Schmidt's as the clock hit 12 and the meeting officially began. The initial pleasantry soon faded away into a mess of diplomatic jargon as veiled bobs and office soon flew across the table. Unsurprisingly, it was not long before the first roadblock hit the status of Germans of Poland. The privileges that Germans in Poland held under the general government are unacceptable. We're practically chattel compared to them, second-class citizens in our own nation. We cannot repeat, cannot go back to the old days, uh, ways of things. Not now, not ever. They cannot continue to hold the privileges that they once did. Vakoviak finished his fiery rant with a hearty slap at the table to applause from his own delegation. The German delegation turned to Schmidt, his face deep in thought. The German delegation turned to Schmidt, his, uh, oh yeah, a partial repeal of the Nuremberg Law, something we, he'd wanted for years, but something that may finally fall well afoul of Speer's expectations besides. Removing the rights of Germans for the wants of Poles, a group that much of Germany still considers Untermensch, was undoubtedly a crap show waiting to happen in itself. However, would the Poles accept a deal without his caveat? He sighed before responding, knowing that these words would leave follow him forever. The Poles deserve rights? Do we believe in that? Keep it the laws. I like the laws. But the Poles deserve rights. And there goes more regime stability. I can't wait to get rid of this. I'll be honest, like I'm sick and tired of regime stability. I'm really just sick and tired of it right now. I'm, I can't wait to get it done. <laughs> this stupid modifier, this little thing, is just... It's fr its so incredibly frustrating. I understand it's supposed to be really difficult. Like, it doesn't make sense why it should be easy. But it's so frustrating to even have it, so... Uh, resistance below. Uh, there we go. We need this one. We definitely have to have that one right now. Um, oh, I don't want to. Thank you. And we're doing the bugs for research and development. But yeah. I'm sick and tired of this. I really am. But Slaves of the Reich followed up with investments for the future. The talks have moved on to the point about the state of Polish economy and the difficulties of housing the people. It appears that the repatriation of slaves would unforgivably push the sorry's position of the Poles into an unbearable corner, and it is up to us to see that what we can do about the Polish requesting a fatherland for direct sponsorship. 
I mean, if I have to do this one, I will, but I don't really want to do it. But the status or status of the home army. Now, Mr. Vakovyak, on to the next topic, the home army. Schmidt read from his agenda slowly, taking a breath before continuing. As previously agreed, the home army will disarm and disband, assuming these talks go through. This is correct, yes? Of course, the other man replied, straining his tie as he spoke. Schmidt rolled his eyes as he reached the next point, bracing himself for the explosion. Of course, yes, yes. However, there have been some calls from a more conservative counterpart to prosecute some of these men for all. Uh, Schmidt could see Vakovyak's re face turning red already, and he rated himself for the explosion. Ah, treason and terrorism. Now, Mr. Vakovyak, these men did, not, did commit acts of violence against the German garrison. The other man shot to his feet. You're joking, Herr Schmidt. You cannot be serious. You dare call fighting for freedom terrorism? Do you know how hard it's been to get the home army to even agree to disarm? They'll go ballistic. If you're going to arrest every freedom fighter in Poland, you may as well uh, <clears throat> arrest this entire delegation because I cannot think of a Polish man who does not fight the Germans. This is unacceptable, Herr Schmidt. Simply unacceptable. He roared, leaning over the table towards the Germans. Schmidt massaged his temples. A headache was coming and he doubted it would get any better until these talks finished. Terrorism is terrorism. The arm disarmament shall suffice. It's good enough for us. Hey, look. oh, thank goodness, we got this one. Oh, 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 that feels a little better now. Uh, most definitely. Please give us more stuff. I like to do this one, but we're not that experienced yet. So, oh, that's a ballistic computer. It's very good, very good. But yeah, this is this uh, campaign is not easy. It's just not easy. I hope to God that. Uh, oh, I still have turn one. We'll wait a little bit for this one. That the conservative side is much easier because I, 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 I'll be honest. I want something easier than this right now. <laughs> All this reloading and resaving and just frustrations that you get with doing this, it is, it is what it is. But hmm, hmm. Uh, civvies and infrastructure, not millies. Those cost more. We have enough millies for now. Nothing down there. Anything up here? Eight. There it's six. Good to keep an eye on everything here. Slaves of the Reich. Investments for the future. And. Pinning the blame, the Polish have requested us to cons reconsider the Nuremberg Laws. They wish for more rights to be afforded to them. This is where trouble comes in. Hostile reactionaries and the conservative allies have come forward with the protests, and Schmidt is still trying to stay on top of this. We must do something about it before the lead be comes off in the negotiations. The status should pull us slavery. Hmm. We both understand that the Führer's policy on slavery is one of his dismantlement. Is that right? Vakovyak spoke first this time, his voice having noticeably softened in the last hour or so. The attention near the table again once turned to him, including Schmidt's gaze. Yes, that would be true, Schmidt responded, his eyes narrowing. A hint of Va Vakovyak's game beginning to form in his mind. Another bombshell of Schmidt's institu intuition was true. And these freed slaves would be repatriated to their home nations, yes? Mr. W's gaze bowled into Schmidt's, who grew increasingly sure of where this conversation was being taken. He prepared a response and said, This would be another headache to add to the pile. Yes, that's the plan, Schmidt responded, stealing his voice. Thousands of Poles will find themselves in German shackles today, Herr Schmidt, with years left before the freedom. Surely, as part of these talks, it is possible to speed their freedom, is it not? Vakovyak's eyes never left Schmidt's eyes as he tried to think of a diplomatic response to this one. Repatriation is a complicated business, especially when combined with... It is a yes or no question, Herr Schmidt. Schmidt, of course, slumped a little in his chair. This was never going to end, was it? We need to stay realistic about repatriation. Push for quicker a Polish repatriation. Stay realistic. I like that one, but... The Poles will strongly approve. And we do get another hit to stability, but the reformist cause does benefit. And we lose some political power, but we have to do that one, so it's totally fine. And how's this, how's this Zolvaron? We can't even focus on the Zolvaron at all. Like, this is so bad. But honestly, not looking too bad. We did get hungry with us, too. We'll get Poland probably as well, so. Oh, and... Oh, yeah, we did have Ruthenia. White Ruthenia. Belarus. Whatever you guys call it. It's all Eastern European to me. They're still six. So, investments for the future. Pinning the blame. Followed up with... Das Konigsberger Abkommen. All the talks have come to an end, and only time will tell whether the Poles will agree to sign a treaty with our foreign minister at the end or the city of Königsberg. Ah, oh, I love that city. Let us hope good things come out of this, should this succeed. This will be a historical monument in the reconciliation of relations between our people and the Poles. And do we have another one? Please tell me we have another one, because we're going to get hit again with our stability. God, bad word. That's so much baby. Oh my gosh. The Polish budget. Before this conference wraps up, Herr Schmidt, we have about one more topic to discuss. Vakovyak carefully pressed forth with his last topic on his paper. Catching Schmidt as he was about to rise from his seat, Schmidt froze for a second, his face momentarily betraying the stress this conference had put on him, before he sat back down and gestured for Vakovyak to continue. Besides the infrastructure built for Poland to become the Reich's logistical hub, Poland as a whole was neglected by the Reich. 
Our infrastructure in most places fails, and our utilities are on the brink of failing. Our roads are dotted with holes and cracks. We're on the brink of disaster hashment. The Reich's coffers are certainly not empty. Perhaps we can send some funds to our new government in order to allow us to rebuild? I promise you such funds would be spent on infrastructure alone and nothing more. Schmidt took a deep breath in and out. Of course, they were going for the wallet of the Reich now. As if they already hadn't aimed daggers at the rest of the Reich's institutions. Schmidt wasn't opposed to it himself. He just knew it would be it would maximize the amount of angry paperwork he'd had to sort through in the next month or two. Thoughts of a raging Speer clouded his mind. How many decisions had he already made for the Fuhrer? How many of them had been or directly against his wishes? In any case, it was a less decision to make. And they would all shake hands and retire to the hotel rooms. Schmidt could only hope that his decisions would be acceptable to the Polish government. Otherwise, this was going to be quite messy for everyone involved. Can I rent them the money? There is no point. There is no point. I can already tell that whenever we get these next countries done, we're going to need so much more regime stability. I can't wait to get this one over. I'll be honest. <laughs> It's too frustrating to do to try to go as fully liberal as possible. Oh my goodness. Oh, bad words. Just just so many bad words. Are you guys doing anything yet? No, if they don't do anything. We're kind of okay then. But pinning the blame. And Königsberg. What a shame. What happened to that city? Are they? Six health go. Um, I'm just waiting for this one to pop up again. And another event. Status of the Nimberglas. Oh, there goes more stability. The ember of the conference was in sight, and Schmidt was for one couldn't wait for it. He had known that his decisions would cause a storm of anger somewhere, no matter what he had said, but he couldn't help but feel like this was going to be especially bad. His eyes, which had begun to glaze over the endless conversation, snapped back to attention when they saw Vakoviak rise from his feet, or Wacho, Wacho, Wacho Viak, whatever, rise from his seat. Now I understand we already have touched on the topic of the Nuremberg Laws. Oh Christ, Schmidt thought, if there was something to fill his desk with angry letters, it was a Nuremberg Laws, but we've only spoken of the excessive privilege that Germans held in Poland. What we have not discussed is Polish rights, specifically how limited they are. As the dude went through the list of limits on the poles, Schmidt's thoughts turns inwards. Once again, here was an opportunity to strike another blow with something he had hated since the day he joined this job. The Nuremberg Laws, an updated weight on the ankle of Germany, one that needed to be cut off in any other case. He would not hesitate in cutting another slice of the laws, but now? The laws were the main legal guideline for Germany's treatment of poles. Such a massive change would definitely be bigger, or something Speer would like to know about, and that was what was holding Schmidt back. He did not know Speer's position on the issue, but and despite how much he disliked the man personally, Speer was the one who controlled his job. To go against him too much might just lead to his dismissal, something Schmidt couldn't allow to happen. So, uh, <clears throat> Herr Schmidt, I ask you, Vakoviak finished with a flourish, leveling an accusatory finger at Schmidt's head, Is the Reich truly as reformist as it claims? Will you throw off the shackles that bind Poland? Tone down the laws? This is too much to This is a bit too much. Let's be real. This is a bit too much to ask. You know, a bit too much. Okay, there we go. Ooh. <laughs> this sucks, man. This really sucks. <laughs> Alright, looks like we might have gotten something else here to do as well. Because... Oh wait, well this one just gives us well, weekly stability, which is nice. We have a lot of stability. And gives us 5% more regime stability, which we're going to need. <laughs> oh, we made it. At least for the polls for now. And? Und! Well, there's nothing else we can do. What? Ah, the treaty signed. Urgh, that's going to cost us a lot of regime stability. So... TV crews roared a crowd of the conference room. Reporters crammed themselves in every nook and cranny of the building. And the flash of cameras rattled like machine guns. Schmidt did his best not to blink at the barrage. The last thing he needed on top of the inevitable storm he was going to catch was an unflattering image of him smearing across the front pages of every newspaper in Germany. To his right, Vakoviak sat and smiled, looking quite pleased with himself. Schmidt couldn't blame him. He was going to go home a hero, having taken on the German giant and wrangled a deal that Poland could get, could get behind out of it. Schmidt was less enthused himself. He would be going home to a storm of conservative anger, most likely at least one or two tense meetings with Speer. He, Speer, hadn't said anything about the terms yet, but some of them would certainly be enough to make him tear what remained out of his hair. And yet, at the end of the day, Schmidt was proud of himself. He not only succeeded in the task, but he advanced his cause. Germany was on the cusp of entering a new golden age. And with Schmidt's help, he would make sure it would happen. With the treaty signed, who knew what could happen with the rest of Eastern Europe? Perhaps soon enough, Germany could truly be first among equals in their eyes, not just a colonial overlord. And so, Vakoviak put the pen to paper and signed his name on the treaty. Schmidt's expression turned into a small grin as he put his ink on his own. The new golden age is almost here. So, we're going to lose 10% regime stability causing a coup. So, what we're going to do next is this. Oh, uh, we can do this one. I'm going to go back in time. Take charge reactions with treason. Get an extra, basically, 10%... Ultimately, 10% more regime stability. Do this again. Take out Austin. And we'll probably do one of these. Uh, French, great game, no. Poland, we'll probably do Ukraine. Uh, actually, I forget which one we have to do specifically, but we'll do Ukraine first. 
Well, not as unstable as awesome. Ukraine must be dealt with as soon as possible. It is imperative that the political status of the breadbasket of Europe changes as part of our drive towards foreign policy reform, and I will see you in just a little bit. All right, everyone. So, the Königsberg Treaty has been signed. So, got um Gottes Willen Schmidt, what have you done? And actually, right now, we do have 35.4% uh, regime stability. As you can see, I almost collapsed, but uh, <laughs> we're getting there. And we got nine political power. This really sucks. <laughs> Oh man, what is that? Was that negative modifier? Huh? Has a strongly conservative monthly tick and conservative pivot. Social outlook 320 out of 500. This is so, man. I mean, at least with this path for now, I'm learning this quite a bit, but Jesus Christ. But now it's time for Ukraine. Over the Dnipa. Wait, why do we get. Let me just. I think this is impossible. I think this is impossible. In the aftermath of the power struggle between the two opposing sides in Ukraine, the collaborations have won out. This is fantastic news for us and gives us a clear shot at reintegrating the Ukrainians back into the Einheits Pact. Due to the nature of the new Reich, however, we will need to approach this in a new way if we're going to give them any reason to join back in, besides having sympathies in Germany. I'll be honest, man. Yeah, okay, we can't do this. We just can't do this. This needs to be... I, I understand that this reformist stuff shouldn't be easy. It should not be easy at all. But... There's literally nothing we can do. There's literally nothing we can do if we want to get this one. I mean, my god. How many times? How much time do I have to waste off screen to get this stuff all done? Why? The administrative issue. We've had two options at hand. One to please the reformists, the other to please the conservatives. The first option is to empower Volodymyr Kubilevich and his committee, who has shown a clear interest in independent Ukraine. This will be a stable regime with the people, but unpopular with our party. The other option is to reshuffle the cabinet and install a military junta, which would please the conservative clique in the NSDAP at the cost of significant political stability in Ukraine. The choice is ours. Not really. We don't have a choice. Because we're just not given enough stability. We're literally not given enough stability. We're only 35%. There's nothing literally that we can do. This is pissing me off. I'm sorry, but this is really starting to piss me off. After everything that we've done so far, this is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But... Leonhard Weidenmann sat across from the t long table staring down at Volodymyr Kubitschevich, already having discussed with each other for the past 30 minutes. He was flanked by two other German diplomats while Mr. K sat with a merely guard, with merely a guard beside him. Weidenmann spoke first, a smooth tongue and smooth expression. Mr. Kubitschevich, he began speaking in German to Ukrainian. As you know, you are collaborators of the GGR, and as you know, we have recently had a shift in administration. Most importantly, as it stands, we are at a precipice. Can you tell us why the Rada should be kept? Kubev uh, Kubiovich nodded. Of course, the reasoning is simple. If you wish to keep the population content with your rule, you must give them a semblance of democracy. Besides that, a civilian administration will be less of a burden on the Reich and will have long-term positive effects on the popular perception of Ukraine remaining in the Einheits Pact. Spoken like a true collaborator, a Biden man not noted. A German nodded. I believe that should bring our negotiations to a close, Mr. Kubiovich. Or oh, how do we pronounce the name? Whatever. The Reich will make its choice now, and the facts shall realize themselves in a few weeks' time. I assume you wish to know the discussions? Kubiovich na naturally nodded. I, I, I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I know it's supposed to be difficult. I said this before, but there's nothing we can do. There's literally nothing we can do. So, basically, the devs made it impossible. I don't like that about the devs, then. If they literally make it impossible for you to get 50% to get over here, I don't like that. I really don't like that. Um, I just, I almost, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I really do apologize, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at my end here. I've done this for at least like an hour and a half off screen, trying to do this fairly, but the devs made it so you can't do it fairly at all. Why? Why? I mean, look at this. Why? This pisses me off to no end. I, I'm sorry, but this is ridiculous. Galicia's loyal sons. There's no need for Arada. The Ukrainian people do not need a guided democracy. They will only listen to the Reich as we instill or install a military junta. The NSDAP will appreciate this move, though the citizens of Ukraine will not. We will launch a propaganda campaign during the process of reintegration about the division Galizian to show the people that loyalty to the Reich will pay off in due time. They only need to bend the knee. That pisses me off. I'm sorry, but this pisses me off to no end. Seriously, uh, Shapiro needs a rework. I'll be honest. This needs just a little bit of tweaking. A little bit more tweaking. So it can actually, it's possible to actually get this done. Because right now, it is impossible to do this. Like, Amur was hard. In the beginning stages, Amur was hard. Doing LBJ and doing all the great society, I did that fair and square as well. That was not easy, but it was manageable. This stuff, you can't do it. You literally can't do it. And as several to people told me already in the comments and on my Discord server, <laughs> so other people had to cheat. And they like that I'm not trying to cheat, but my god, there's nothing you can do. There's literally nothing you can do. Uh, since they're at night, let's wait. They might do something else here that uh, 
might screw them up, but this pisses me off to no end. This really pisses me off. <laughs> Doing everything else was for a waste. If we're going to go full reformers, we can't do it. The Provisorisha Regiru. We can no longer follow the old model of the Reich's Commissariat. It must be reformed, and depending on what we have chosen, it will either be light reforms to curb the worst effects from before, or more experimental freedom to the Ukrainian people. Whatever the matter is, the fate of the breadbasket of Europe will be determined here and now, as the opening pages of a new provisional government begin to be written. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I've tried my best. I've literally tried my best here. That, And I can tell you that the devs do not want you to go full reformers. You have to cheat. You just have to cheat. So incredibly stupid. I mean, maybe I'll try to get off screen, but I'll be honest. Like I, I, I said before, I'm done. I, 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 this is too much. <laughs> this is going make me go insane because of all the crap in here. Eh, if we have to choose one, if we lose one round, one turn, that's okay. I might try to get off screen, but Jesus Christ, this is stupid. And now we're, we can't do this one. How are you supposed to get more stability? Like, seriously, honestly. How are you supposed to get more stability? I'm sorry this is turning into a rant, but this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. You do not have enough stability for anything to do all this stuff? <sighs> Pisses me off. The armed forces. In the end, this will be a step forward for the Ukrainian people. And even if they cannot see it, the new Ukrainian state shall be led by one of the here. And this sort of new... An open show of dominance will please the conservatives greatly. However, we still need a man loyal at the top to lead the operation when we found one. Yuri Tis, a veteran general with sympathies to Germany. With him at the helm and the hair at the side, Ukraine will find its place again in Einheit's Pact. So significantly, I mean, Jesus Christ. Honor the brave. Who else but the Ukrainians have fought so hard and so long for us? There are, of course, but the occasional voices crying hypocrisy on our part, but they're silent in comparison to the Fuhrer. Alba Schmel will be personally holding a speech in the coming days, asking help from his cabinet, and especially Tresco, to make sure that he hits all the notes, and strike simply with the Ukrainian people, as well as for the boost of support for the military government. So stupid, man. And we're at nine. At least we'll tie. Let's say we won't win, which is good. Hold a speech. I mean, we don't even have political power to do this, really. I, I could keep doing this again and again and again and again. It's just, and let's look at this stuff. The heart of Russia. Uh, actually, the Caucasus is better to do. In the swirling dark fog of the Caucasus lies our most disconnected and mysterious Reich Commissariat. As a key producer of oil, this territory must be completely stabilized if it is to continue serving the interests of the Reich. And let me guess, it's going to cost even more regime stability. And we'll go and read about establish the Eastern Commission. There is one noticeable benefit from installing a military junta in Ukraine. The fact that it can now serve as a reliable training field for green officers coming from the Wehrmacht. Henning von Trusko will be assigned the duty of sta staffing Ukraine with officers, new and old, loyal to the Reich and not to Shona's clique. His influence must remain with the Muscovine and nowhere else. Actually, what does this one say? The mad count? Let me guess. You're going to lose more stability here. You're just going to lose more stability. Hmm. Reminisce of Warriors. As always, there was a man who came up to the stand before the Fuhrer did, announcing his many roles and ending as the leader of the GGR. Then he retired, letting Alba Shpia take himself the podium and beginning to speak. Even with his advanced age, the sharpness of his tongue did not decline. This speech shall address both the Fuhrer's people and the people of Ukraine for too long. You fought valiantly for us for too long. Blood has been spilled in the Dnieper River for the sake of maintaining the integrity of the Ukrainian state and its loyalty to the Reich. We cannot let that go unrewarded today. With the restoration of the rightful government, the Ukrainian people can now move forward. Cheers and whistles were met in response, and Shpira took a moment to nod before continuing. To the brave fighters of Ukraine, I dedicate this speech to you. We shall honor the men who died for Ukraine, who died for the Reich, who died serving a greater cause than themselves. I dedicate this speech to my people for knowing the Ukrainians are loyal allies, for realizing this potential and bringing them into the Reich's protecting wing. Now I shall speak about the fallen. To the German citizen and Ukrainian patriot, I hope that all will listen as I speak of their deeds. It went on for quite some time. I'll be honest, I just thought of this. I'd love to see whoever the devs are for Speer's, uh tree. I'd love to see them show, like, actually show us how we're supposed to get all this stuff done. Uh, I'm going to do adaptive command because I like more organization for infantry. I'd love to see, like, a, is there a campaign? Like, please let me know in the comments below. Is there a campaign where someone goes full reformist without using cheats? I would love to know. I would love to see the devs actually show us if it's possible. Because <laughs> this is pissing me off. I spent so much time with this already. But the plains of blood and snow await our attention in the east. The disappearance of Siegfried Kosh has shifted the political landscape of Muscovy, a situation we must maintain absolute control over if the Reich's territories are to survive and thrive. I could take this one, but it's a little too low too late. But maybe we'll do that. maybe I'll do that one later. Maybe we'll see. In any case, if you want to read about that, please go ahead. The Rada, Resurrect Ukrainian Academia, and Back in the West, and we'll read about touch finishing touches. Ukraine has gotten through its worst period of instability yet, and it can be uh, safely said that it can now, as a territory, return to the Einheitspact proper. One of our biggest problems that has now been resolved 
and this has been hailed by many as a triumph of Germany over the East once more. The remnants of the old regime will be scrubbed out, and so the new one shall rise, along with Germany. With the former frontier beginning to settle down in peace, we can turn our attention elsewhere. The Mad Count, and where's the one about Russia? Ah, oh, if you want about that, please go ahead. Read from loyalty. Uh-huh, sure. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. As you can tell, I... This is stupid. I don't like this. I really don't like this. Is in a faction with us? Natives such as that. All right. Uh, I gotta go down here to the Caucasus. Okay. Oh, well, I can't get down there yet. Well, that sucks. Yeah, they don't have it with us, so... It's fine. But yeah, I, I would love to see a guide. I would love to see... Someone from the dev team actually doing this. And maybe they can do it, because they obviously created it, but... Oh, what is this? 64%? That's not too bad, but... I really don't want to do any operations unless we have, like, a 75% chance. What is this? Oh, yeah, that, that's the one there. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else? Yeah, but this is this is insane. It's just insane. As a fear, Shabir just doesn't have any political power. I mean, yeah, we get, like, two a day. But it's obviously not enough, or at least getting regime stability. <sighs> we'll read this one next, maybe. Uh, read from Loyalty. One should wonder about the settlers, their affections for the follow and we share. Are they still willing to deal with us as we deal with them? Are they still loyal to the homeland of their fathers and mothers? We would have to ensure that they are really loyal, and that would continue. Eager to pursue this, no matter the outcome, we must send a representative to see them, in order to see how things really are on the ground which our people now are now on, and home, and to determine if we would need to encourage them to stay loyal or else. Uh, nice. Oh, that's nice. I like that. That's very good. What else do we have? Anything here? I mean, oh, uh, yeah, bugging would be nice. Uh, so, do we have them yet? Somewhat? Well, that'd be really bad to do it right there. I'll send in the tanks in first. That's probably a little bit better to do from... God dang it. Because I think... What was it? Pen Kitten played as a... Speer before. <laughs> I think he kind of gave up on making uh, campaigns after he did that one, but... <laughs> uh, yeah. You can bribe people as much as you want. You just will never have enough... Regime stability. I think I'll definitely go back, though. I think I'm going to go back. Reform loyalty. And... Yeah, best political promises. I'll probably do that one, too. Uh, the Mad Count. Josiah has crowned himself king of all Caucasia, and this will not be tolerated. Our Reich will not, has not come to life to see this sort of betrayal. We will not let this stand for too long, and we shall not bow down to a king. Let our great German fatherland sort out this mad king's illusions and make the right path of Caucasia. Absolutely. And what else? Arrival in the German southern state. A northbound train delivered a journey that, although mildly uncomfortable and thoroughly frigid, was historic and truly felt antiquated as a snowy Russian countryside came to view through the train's windows. And within one small compartment... The bustling and rocking of the powerful locomotive hardly shook the work Walter Victoro had prepared. Victoro sat excitedly tapping on his briefcase filled with documents of procedural forms as he stared out at the, into the western Russian wilderness, completely losing track of the outside world as the train came to a screech, and the city streets filled his view. Finally, after so much wrongdoing against the Herald Russian, Victoro knew that the time had come to make a difference in the world, and even if the greatest trial awaited him, and he had one thought which dominated his mind, Moscow awaits. However, is Victoro, or Victorov, Victorov, Exited the train, accompanied by a group of German guardsmen straight from Germania. The full force of the trial would strike as he looked around the train station. Everywhere, men and women and children, all with bright, beautiful blue eyes, and adorned with flowing gold, gold, golden hair. All looked as if they had come from a German slum. Exhaustion colored their faces while callousness covered their hands, with some appearing frail and hungry, and all adorning ragged clothes that would bring disgust to most German higher-ups. But Viktorov did not want the prestige or class of higher-ups. This is exactly what Viktorov wanted, even if he could not stand the pleading eyes of the settlers here. At the end of the day, they were the Reich's citizens, as in as proud as they may be, they were suffering, and Viktorov knew that he, as an ambassador on the behalf of the Reich itself, could not allow this any longer. As the snow landed atop his cap, the toy of a young child bounced across the street in front of the capital, nearly prompting a guard to strike the child, were it not for Viktorov's intervention. Handing the child his toy from the next to Viktorov's feet, the diplomat said a few simple words to the boy, Do not be afraid, things have c will change here soon. As a look onwards to the capital building of the Reichs Commissar at Muscovine, as the recent clashings of Germans and Russians flooded his mind, we can do good work here. Hmm. I don't mind the synthetic oil. Synthetic oil is always nice to have. 9 and 12, very good, very good. Uh, oh, and now it's 0 and 8. Well, that's not good. I don't want to spend any, I don't want to spend as least political power as possible. Construction speed goes down. Uh, that could be worse. 2 to 4, 3 to 4? Uh, I don't want to spend PP yet. I don't want to hurt, hurt construction speed. 90, Jesus Christ. <sighs> that's so much. 
But, you know what? Screw it. At this point, I'm kind of defeated at, at this point in the campaign. I'm just really just defeated at this. Uh, let's see if we can go in if, if at all possible. Uh, we need to call all, all of our allies in. Helping Akin. With a report from a man on the ground, we know that Akin needs cash injections to get their economy back on track. Quite a lot of it. Our people in the East have always needed our support since the days after the Second World War was won by our might in Europe and Africa. And now that our civil wars come to an end, they still need our support. The war which we have fought against those did not help want to pursue a better future for Germany, which has made us unable to continue that support for some time. Now we do have time, and we must make use of it. We should start preparing new deliveries of goods and resources, which they will need to rebuild their homes and their communities. Just as we have done for our fatherland, let us make sure that they can do for the same. Mm, nothing really down there yet, so... Uh, research would be good to do. That's fine. Expertise is 100%. Civilian stuff, infrastructure, yes. Not too bad. And not much else. So we need to call all of our allies in. There we go. Let's go in. Uh, maybe just let the tanks and motorized do it. I think they'll be okay with us killing them off like this. Yeah, I think I'm going to go back. I'm going to try it. I'm trying to go... I'm, I will try to go back. And kill my uh, patients with this again. Oh, report one. Classification. Aus Valtegus Samt. Our arrival at the train station within Moscow occurred at 0730, with full preparations made in regards to handling the situation with the Reichskommissariat Moscovy. Improvements regarding the stability of the transportation systems between the Reich and the Reichskommissariat could potentially be looked into, however. If anything, the difficulty presented in the transportation systems is a small look into the situation within Moscovy. Politically, the situation within the area appears stable enough to not withdraw supply efforts towards the settlers of the area, nor do any reports in indicate a collapse of the Reich's influence within the areas around Moscow. However, living standards have fallen dramatically for the Aryan settlers within the RKs as well as native Russians. Outbreaks of conflict between the native populaces and the settlers arriving from Germany proper has caused considerable detriment for the German settlements, and Russians within the area have suffered as well despite the advancements made within the area. In this regard, although living conditions have plummeted for all parties within Muscovy and the surrounding Russian nation-state, the populace has espoused a supreme loyalty towards the Reich itself, and in an effort to support the German and Russian within the area, the developing situation has been taken with the greatest priority for a diplomatic envoy. Thus, actions towards the advancement of Operation a great white will begin immediate with immediate implementation within the interactions between the Rexkomasar Kash's successor, needed of leadership within the party, or within the newly established state for the Russians while outside of Rexkomasar Muscovy, and then the diplomatic envoy you've assigned me to, and the transportation to the capital of the nation state of the Russians will be arranged to aid our mutual efforts through a hopeful admittance into the Einheit's pact. Due to the glory of the Reich, Vata Victoro, the Fuhrer will be pleased. Well, at least someone's pleased here. <laughs> Followed up helping our kin, showing our commitment. The economy of our people living in the East is not strong enough to stand by itself. Therefore, to make sure that our people can live more easily in the future, we must provide not only the materials and tools they need to rebuild their world, but the money they need to buy the things they need and want, and to stimulate their economy by letting the cash flow. It should do some good, at least, if it doesn't show the immediate results. We must hope that it would in the future, but to make it to that kind of goal, cash would have to be injected into the East regularly until such time that they have no longer need of it. That way, it would be sustainable as it made its influence on the economy more significant. And by doing this, it would have to show that we remain committed to the future. In return for that, they better show their gratuity in some way. Very good, very good. They can't really beat us, which is good. Oh, all right, and showing a commitment. Steep cost, so be it. Back to the pack. We must celebrate the results of our efforts for the Falalam. Our settlers remain loyal to the Reich, and as they remain loyal, we improved their economy and made better their lives out in the East, in times perhaps. They would enjoy the same blessings we all have in the Fatherland. For now, however, it was time to invite them back into the pact. We have already dealt with the rest, and though such support did not come free, all they would have to do is obey some of our requests, and so long as they went along with them, they would be free to do any other thing that was impermissible. We've chosen Alexis von Roen, together with Otto Rehmer, to go to the settlers, and there they would manage the new government. Things were becoming much better. For now, at least. Well, at least for the settlers. My mental state is just collapsing right now, so. I guess we can do that one again eventually, but. Yeah, no. I, I'd love to see the devs do this. I would love to see them do this perfectly one time through. And are they, are they dead? No, they did. Good. Very good. Now it's probably going to hurt regime stability again, isn't it? Mm, nothing here yet. All right, all right. Showing our commitment. Protect the oil. Back to the pact. Followed up with... Actually, can we do that one immediately? As all things should be? Good. Everything is in order now. The state of our settlers is secure. The economy stands firm. Their loyalty to our fatherland is assured. They return to the protective embrace of the pact. And within our grasp is a Brandestadt. With it, the city's advantages, along with its importance to the settlers and to us, shall keep us on the higher ground just above the Slavs of the East. We will have little to worry about for now. But we shall make sure that our blessings shall last, and to keep it that way, we will do our best with our minds set on the future. A journey across the border. 
Luckily, the Muscovine government had always been more than cooperative with Viktorov's work over the past few days, and has granted his convoy protection and given him absolute clarity and comfort regarding their business in the capital and preparations for negotiation. Viktorov knew that as the days went on. The time before he ventured to forward to meet with officials of the Russian nation grew shorter and shorter yet. Despite his excitement for the eventual departure and work, everything left him confounded in the reasoning behind the excitement. Excuse me, Dr. Viktorov, but the convoy has been prepared for transportation, a young secretary said as he had he had missed her knocks on the door. My apologies, Miss Bechow. Right away, the diplomat said as he grabbed the suitcase and followed her out. Everything around him had showcased what he enjoyed, the order, structure of all, and now it was finally his time to make a difference. The time to make a difference that his predecessors of the past did not, he continued. Thinking of the pictures of his family he kept so neatly tucked away back home in Germania. The carvings of the beautiful little box delighted Viktorov, in contrast with the contents, as he saw capturings of the times of a Russian family working its hardest to get through the wall set up by the German forces. How great the suffering his grandparents have faced as they crossed over into the new land of Germany, and the dreaded persecutions of Viktorov's face being being foreign immigrants in a hostile land, but no more, no more crushed dreams. No broken souls from either side, as each and every hardworking German and Russian around Muscovine has earned their right to support from the fatherland, and earned an end to the troubles which plagued them. Viktorov continued his thoughts as he finally made it outside the capital, alongside his fellow statesmen and the Waffen Regiment accompanying them deep into the Russian lands. The frost encapsulating the trucks reminded Viktorov of his grandfather and grandmother as the convoy began to move away from Muscovine territory. What an exciting trip! Yeah, we can do that. Why not? Who cares at this point, right? Who cares? Who cares? Why not? And back to the pact. Plenty the natives. Oh crap. Oh, I guess we can't do that one yet, huh? That sucks. Protect the oil. The war to overthrow a king should not, who should not be a king has come to an end, and for good. It is time for us to secure interests, Caucasia's teeming with oil, and oil is a vehicle of life for our fatherland. It is important for us to keep it safe from the restless natives, and so, despite the cost, we will station brave men to oversee the security of our workers who are eager to keep the fatherland alive through the oil, which flow through the pipelines, no matter how much. Alright, so with this one, I think we got to kill them off too, right? Yeah, just in case, let's prepare a, a, just a massive detachment here. I don't trust these people. Eh, keep you guys there, you guys can do this. Uh, well, whatever. Actually, who, who leads here? Ah, Clousing. Look at the natives. The idea of supporting the natives with an injection of cash along with some material assistance is interesting to us. Unfortunately for us, it's the only meaningful way to change a balance of powers to the stages which replace our former Rex Commissariat, after all. We can't do much against the natives, so why not help them instead? Let us hope that this will be our first step to solving the dilemma of our settlers and those Slavic dogs. If they could swallow the bait, then our fatherland could lure them back under our influence. A stranger in a strange land. We have more military factories, which we just... Why do we get more military factories? We don't need them. Um, here, you can have some some of that, and then some of this. And a lot of that, and a lot of this. The soft rumblings of treading through dirt and snow tore apart into the ha harsh rocking and buckling by the envoy struck as it met hard gravel and it's a sound like it would tear off the tires at any minute. As the entourage continued onwards, the silence slowly transformed from an excited admiration of the Russian land to a dreaded silence, with each rotation of the tires bringing another wave of confusing tensions as the Waffen guards present, present in Viktorov's truck prepare, pre prepare themselves. It was confusing to Viktorov, to say the least, until the trucks finally passed through the iron gates of the city. There, appearing through the windows of a heavily armored truck, Viktorov, for the first time in his life, received a glimpse into, as to what his grandmother and grandfather escaped all those years ago. The glimpses of children roaming the streets without parents in sight in rags, fighting over a piece of bread which had been stained by the mud on the ground. Across the street, Viktorov caught glimpses of three men beating another fellow Russian on the ground, pummeling him with bats, punches, and kicks as they stripped him of his bag and coat and ducked off into the alleyway, passing by a duo of nurses carrying a uh, body carrying with a tarp outside of a health center. The homeless had grown in number as he saw groups of armed men har harassing a young woman coming out of her home, seemingly asking for overdue money owed to them, and Viktorov could only pray for her safety as the convoy moved on. Viktorov continued to think and debate with himself as to what had become the fate of the Russian people. What could have done this? Were the politicians in charge of the state that greedy, or were there some sort of crisis causing all of this? Viktorov continued to pray for the hope that things had not been completely his way for his ancestors. As the motorcade came to a halt outside the Capitol building, Viktorov continued to dust himself off and grab his brief gift as his eyes locked onto a particular light. A little girl, no older than seven, grabbed at the chain Link fence as she continued to stare at the Germans inside. She looked thinly and only had dirty rags on, yet her brown eyes glimmered in the snow, reminding Viktorov of the daughter he always wanted. That was until a little boy began to chase her for the bread in his hands. In her hands. I hope we can help these people too. 95. Jesus Christ. I mean, the devs just hate you when you, when you do this, but... Well, okay, well, to each according to their blood. Alright, the natives will require more help to get their pitiful country back into working order. Oh, look at that. Kubitschek. We will be more than happy to provide them with such aid. 
But seriously, I would, you know what, I would like to see, I would really like to see the devs, like, trying out different paths that they came up with, and putting it on YouTube or something. Stream it, like, I think that'd be really cool. Like, show them, like, oh, this is how you do things, how you do other stuff. And maybe not even just, like, you know, like, old world blues, maybe that'd be kind of cool. Or, maybe just other mods. Um, hmm. We'll try it, I guess. Six and eight, huh? Mm. I don't mind spending army XP. We need at least four. Ah, oh, screw it. Let's spend some PP. Who cares about PP right now anyways, right? Wipe away the debt. The Slavs are taking the bait, eagerly pulling themselves to towards it. The more they receive aid from a great fatherland, the more they depend on it on, and depended on it, and the more they owed us for it. Now they've reached their breaking point. They will soon come to us for negotiations. We must seize a chance to exploit it. When their representatives come to the table to meet us, we must take an offer they cannot help but accept. For us to wipe away the debt they have, they must grant us Brauschitzstadt. They would have to think about it, as all men do when presented with offers, and like all men, they will have to enjoy what we give them in exchange for what they have to give up. Oh dear, it appears the natives have racked up quite a debt to the Reich. Sadly, we aren't in the mood to give them slack. They can wipe away their debt with Brauschitzstadt and some leadership, new leadership, to boot. Cool. And a farewell. Uh, Alright, i do this up here. Thank you. And, okay. Surely there must be something you can do to stop this Oberlander. An indignant Shona press the president of the Reichstag was becoming rather dissatisfied with the conversation. You have the party's ear, the Reich's ear. If you call this injustice what it is, an injustice, then they will listen to you. He slammed his fist against the table, clearly an expression of outrage. They will be forced to listen to you if they do not want the Reich's populace in arms. If you think that this is in any way my business, you are wrong, Herr Shona. Oberlander carefully ran his hand over the top part of the table that Shona had hit, trying to be sure that he had not left a mark in it. The table had been a gift from his mother, and he did not want it ruined by a late last night visit from or last late night visit from his ranting madman. What sort of outrage would I invoke, informing the people that a military official had received a new assignment? And what would the outrage of the people of the Reichstag accomplish with against our Führer's directives? Shona regarded the doctor with a look of undisguised disgust, flavored with the desperation of a starving man begging for scraps. Oberlander, do you not see what Speer is doing? He is ridding himself of every last competent and pure-minded member of the administration. He seeks to, be, to bastardize National Socialism, to bring about some Judeo-liberal fantasy. You and I, we are the only ones who still command enough sway to stop him before he ruins everything. There was looks of hunger, anger. Hungry anger. Something intensely frightening. We cannot let them do this. And an Oberlander considered Shona for a second. It seemed like madness. The bitter ramblings of a disgruntled general. And, like, and yet, some of what he spoke rang true. Perhaps now was the time to make a stand, to make a move against Speer. Then Oberlander noticed his wife spearing, peering into the room, wondering why Theodor had not returned to bed. Meeting her eyes, the president of the Reichstag rose. Herr Shona, I believe you have a train to catch. To the Reich will not collapse without you. A meeting of fates. As the grandfather clock in the corner of the room continued to tick, the weight upon Walter Viktorov's shoulders seemingly doubled. He stared into a seemingly seeming nothingness as the words upon the transcripts laid in, out in front of him blurred as all the man could see was the images of his days with the surrounding area. The dispersedness and near predatory nature of some of the groups that had formed outside the Muscovine territory. How could the self-governed area fall apart so quickly, yet the room he sits in remains so lavish? Suddenly, the wrinkled face of the anti-Soviet man, Bronislav Kaminsky, entered the room, offering a nod and handshake to the diplomat. Brig Brigade Fyodor Kaminsky, and it is an honor to meet you. My name is Dr. Walter Viktorov. Uh, he started before being cut up by Kaminsky. The diplomat sent by Speer, huh? We've been waiting for your arrival. What's the terms? Viktorov hadn't pictured such exhaustion from Kaminsky, but then again, of all the area, had been a surprise, hasn't it? Viktorov took out the first report in the file and began discussing the Fyodor's desires out of Kaminsky to pay for the incredible amount of support issued to the native state via the seating of Brasichstadt and the swearing of loyalty to the Einheitspact. Viktorov's seemingly hopeful words brought him to look up, only to meet the image of Kaminsky hunched over the desk, both hands clasping his face. They'll march in and hang me, joining the Einheitspact. The natives, they've given... And finally, as if a sledgehammer broke through a castle made of sand, everything came together for Viktorov. The terms, the seeding of territory, the governmental lavishness, yet the hopelessness, and the butchers remaining outside. This wasn't Kaminsky's misdoings. They've been paying everything t towards the Reich. They couldn't stand on their own. They needed help, and now it suddenly dawned on him. Operation Great White. Viktorov wasn't serving as a negotiator here. He was a predator, a loan shock. In the end, Kaminsky, with eyes that seemed had the life sucked out of them, shook to the agreement of losing Brasichstadt and joining the pact. With every step, from leaving the Capitol building to walking to the trucks, to staring at the windows as they rumbled out, Vikt Walter Viktorov felt one thing alone, the eyes of a starving, broken Russians. God help us. God help me right now to get through this. <clears throat> as all things should be, which is good. Uh, Rebel Grozny. The city of Grozny has been a treasured center of the native population of Caucasia. It's important for us too, therefore. It is our duty to rebuild it. The natives will surely be grateful, but we too will be grateful 
to see it rebuilt for the sake of the prosperity of the Reich. It'd be a great deal of expense, but resurrecting the city should pay for it. The exile, he cracked his gloved knuckles with a grunt, glaring out over the snowy plains as the setting sun burned the sky with its orange hue. A war was coming. He could sense it. Those Slavic scum across the borders of Militar Bezak Ruslan were unifying, preparing themselves for an invasion of Germany and the destruction of the Aryan race. Until that time came, the Field Marshal would have to contend with grimy Russian partisans in the cities and wilderness. That was why he was here, after all. Field Marshal Ferdinand Schorner and his brave allies were conveniently carted off to the snowy crap hole by the busting of the magnanimous Führer, where they would seal the right by protecting the Eastern Front from whatever insane faction managed to unite Russia. Schorner plucked the cigarette out of his mouth and spat out onto the snow. He didn't know whether to be furious or flattered at being and granted such an exile. Then as the vipers that was Germany could never have prepared him for the disgusting Mittelair Berserk, where the German and Slav practically skipped through Muscovy hand in hand. What was the point of hunting down terrorists, training troops, and securing the eastern border if such degeneracy was allowed in the cities? The failed marshal shook his head and took another puff. It was only a matter of time before miscegenation was legalized in this territory. Mittelair Berserk Russland deserved new leadership. Someone with the strength and courage of Shauna, with the loyalty and obedience of Rama, and with the determination displayed by the military's clique, and as for the leadership of the Reich. Shauna smirked Italy to himself, and threw a cigarette into the snow where it hissed back at him. He stomped on it with his jackboot and set off towards his men. Great things come to those who wait. Which is actually something my dad told me the other day. Just saying. But anyways. Uh, eight and ten? Well, at least Russell is looking pretty darn awesome, I'll be honest. Run. Very, very nice. My apologies. My cat wants to be let out of the room finally. Ah, uh, my apologies. Actually, I was surprised Binky wanted to be in this room for as long as he was. Oh, boy. We're looking pretty darn good. Hopefully we get it, and we'll, and we'll win there. Yeah, but uh, I guess now that time has passed, oh, Jiminy had Jiminy returns. Eleven's drama is ours once more, which is great. Calm down a little bit, but still pissed off. As all things should be. We should be pissed off. <laughs> uh, God dang it. But seriously, I want to see the devs do this. I would love to see the devs do this. Asisko Kazia. Uh, why not? We cannot leave this land alone to reorganize and to reform itself alone. It would wither like a flower in the desert. Let us make sure that our fatherland gives it the support it needs to get back on its feet. Though this shall bring a great load upon the shoulders of our economy, it will be worth it, as a region great holds great promise for the future of the Reich. There we go. Uh, propaganda campaign ended. Oh boy, we don't have enough political power for this yet. Because we can have the budget. Money is no problem. Political power? That's a huge problem. But now we have enough. Do we have more here, too? Uh, we can hold another speech if we really want to. I don't know if we need to save political power for later, either, so. <sighs> On to Neyman. Uh, it's only 64%. It's not good enough. I'm not going to do it with it if it's only 64%. There's no way in the world I do that. Uh, what do we have here? Two to four, two to four. I want big. I want to go big. Go big. Follow it up with. Screw it. Who wants political power? I don't apparently. Secure interests. We must bring an end to the chaos of Caucasia. At our own expense, it is vital to secure the land with the help of a new government under Friedrich Klausing. With him in charge of the land, we will surely see a repayment for our expenses. Good. Give us the resources. And hopefully another event. Anything else here? All right, no, it doesn't look like it. And the Reconstruction Committee. Oh, now it pops up. After so much expense and after so much time, Caucasia is coming alive again. Although this has been close to the hearts of those who have done their duty for the Fall of Lamb, it is time for us to start letting go. Therefore, a committee of men shall be established to take the reins from us in our time, or in time, with a trust placed in our arms. There will be prosperity to enjoy for the future of the Reich and Caucasia. Great, a simple matter of time. Spiel glanced up from his work as Erhard walked into his office with the little ceremony, not even... <clears throat> pretending to offer the customary salute and greeting as he fell into one of the chairs in front of the Führer's desk. In his hands was an overstuffed manila folder, filled to the brim with what was doubtlessly more paperwork that would go to, to, uh, that would do to his headache no favors. He slid the folder across the table, disturbing the many forms and memos that Speer had been reading before the economist had really walked in. Was that really necessary, Speer asked. Exhaustion dulled any anger that he may have felt at the insolence of the act of mere annoyance. What do you want, Erhard? Ireland's economy has been fully integrated into the Zulveran, he replied, briefly fumbling with a lighter as he brought a cigar hidden in his suit pocket to his lips. That folder there has all the relevant information on the integration process, he said, smoke wafting from his mouth as he spoke, eyeing the folder with some degree of wariness and wariness. Speer opened it and began leafing through the imme intimidating stack of papers. Summarize it for me, he said idly. Ehad sighed, taking the cigar from his lips. 
It was disgustingly easy it began, ever since the coup, now that the new tower shop, Blaney, has been falling over himself to offer more and more concessions to us. I'm surprised he didn't call my office begging to be let in the economic program. His chuckle was mirthless. With that, combined with the fact that Ireland's economy was almost completely dominated by Oz, even before the Depression a few years back, it was child's play that simply reinforced those old contracts and allowed them entry. Even you have... Could have done it. No offense, of course. Of course, Spear grumbled. At least that's the Irishman had put to bed. Oh yes, Erhard agreed. Ireland is now officially ours. Ireland returns returns to where it began. So good. Erhard's demands flat income tax. Smoke had long uh, displaced any clear air in the room, despite the cracked windows. The meeting had overshot its expected length by over an hour, and Erhard showed no signs of stopping the torrent of figures that somehow poured from the mouth. While he chewed a cigar, even those with more of a head for figures had begun to tune out. Spear's eyes glanced towards the seats. Others seated at the table. The various hangers-on were frantically flicking through the papers, trying to keep up. Kiesinger was doing his best to appear interested, but Albert recognized the glassy look in his eye. Reich Reichsminister Schmidt was making his own way through the tome uh, Erhard had provided, tilting his head and nodding at some paragraph incomprehensible to human eyes. The Fuhrer redirected his attention back to the economist as he seemed to be coming to the end of some point. Tax exemptions and exemptions abolished. Tax deductions reduced drastically, and the implementation of a true fixed-rate income tax. Schmidt's eyebrows raised at the sentence. You know well as I do that our industry relies on those tax breaks, Friedrich. The Reichswerke reinvested half of what they saved on new equipment this year. How much are you proposing for this tax? Reichskommissar Erhard took another drag of his cigar, worked out about his mouth, and exhaled through the table. 40%. At that slumped neck straightened and eyes refocused, Speer coughed, and not because of that smoke. That's ridiculous, he settled on, unable to think of a better word. Aji Fabin alone would have my head. They've been paying less than 20 since the war. Friedrich didn't appear ruffled, just inhaled more smoke. The ridiculous it may seem, mind fear, but I can assure you that is quite sound. The people have been holding the burden of taxation for decades. Regressive tax policies may have expanded industries, but they have become bloated. Forcing the industrial conglomerates to pay what they owe while allowing the people to spend more will force a new equilibrium, one they will appreciate far more than those fat slaving dudes that Fabin did. The Fuhrer once again took stock of the room. Schmidt's eyes had brightened and his nods turned from the paper to Speer. General Feld Marshal von Tresco looked skeptical, but kept his thoughts to himself. Deputy Fuhrer Kiesinger leaned over to Schmidt, hoping to glean some information. Political reform is not possible without economic reform. The Reich's industries depend on the money. Ehard is a very stubborn man. Reform. Hey, ten. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely do that one. I swear to God, man, this campaign. This is one of the campaigns, like. That has frustrated me to no end, man. Even Hadrich, both Hadriches were frustrating, but this was this, they're, they're so easy compared to this. It has demands flat tax income. Telephone for you, my fear. Shpia glanced up, ready to deliver a rebuke at being interrupted mid-sentence before he realized he'd been expecting this call. There were a few others who could demand a conversation with the Führer in this manner. He sighed and gestured for the phone. The minister sat about the table, looking variously confused and intrigued. Save for Ehad, he simply leaned forward in his chair. He the Führer held the speaker or receiver to his ear, speaking. Mein Führer, the voice drawled, barely pronouncing the horror honorific before turning to business. I'm sure these new tax rates haven't escaped your attention. They must be corrected at once. Aji Fabin may have been the biggest name on Herr Ab's business car, but it would certainly be pressed for space. Close to 50 of the Reich's l largest businesses boasted him on their board of directors. Few could others speak to Spiasso brusquely. The Fuhrer looked down at the tax papers that decorated the table at this very moment. He wasn't remotely surprised they leaked, considering the magnitude of Aji Fabin's influence. Herman... You called an ideal time that a hint of sarcasm showed on his face, though a hint of smug tugged at Ehad's lips. We are going through the plans, and your input will be appreciated. Well, then you can sweep them off your desk. You know darn well what these tax breaks do for us, and you can be sure everyone in my phone will in phone book will know what they're doing, where they're going by the end of the day. The phone went dead. Rex, Rex Minister, Ehad chuckled. It seemed like he didn't need to know what Ob's had said. If I may, my field, I don't think it's necessary to respond. The opinion of a man like him is not something you need to worry about. He has too much dirt. We continue as planned. No one will stop us. I swear to God, no one is going to stop us here. It has demands flat tax income. Ludwig surveyed the sheets of figures uh, right across his desk. His domain. The incomes and expenditures of every gal, likes gal, and likes land in black and white. He directed his ministry to spend the last week gathering his data. Gal letters. Did not appreciate intrusion into their affairs, preferring to think of themselves more as lords just to be left to their own. Once gathered, it was just as monumental a task to sort through. But for the knowledge he gained, he would pay any price. The Fuhrer proved more easily moved than he had expected. Perhaps he was sincere after all. One does not ignore the richest man in the rock on a whim. The numer numbers didn't lie, and while there had been a short-term income drop, it had been more than made up for by the sudden and vast flow of currency between the hands of the Reich's citizens. One mark was not one mark, but many, holding value for every transaction it is used in, and taking the money out of the pockets of men like him and Josef Abs was a good deed in itself. They could complain, but if things kept going this way, their oligopolies would be on the way out. We didn't even have to go to Bismarck. We didn't have to go Bismarck, cool. Finally. Right? Oh, well, once this one's done, too. 
I'll, yeah, I, think, I think off screen. I'm going to go back and do this. I don't care. I'm going to bust my head open doing this. I don't care what happens. It really... The difficulty of this campaign, I do not recommend people doing full reformer spear. I'll be honest, I do not recommend it at all. Alright, let's move on. But really, I, I'll be honest, I do not recommend anyone going full reformist. Do not do it. If you're thinking about it, don't do it. <laughs> do not do it if you value your sanity. Alright. Adaptive the training command. Very good. Yeah, 105 political power. Well, wow. we're almost there too. Almost. I don't know. At this point, I mean, my enthusiasm for this campaign has like, been at least cut in half for this. So. <sighs> but let's see what happens when we get to 500 out of 500. Oh, and who's over here, actually? Your old military district, Svedlos, that's not good. Siberia, uh, those guys. And, okay, so we did that one. Now what? A sword over the swastika. Speer felt a chill run down his spine as he read the R&D report on underground movements in the Reich. Are you certain this is Ackergale in the R&D head? Some of these groups, I'm sure the Gestapo we did in the mouth, root, and stem 30 years ago. I'm positive, mind fear. It's likely that many junior members of such organizations we were beneath the Gestapo's notice at the time. I wouldn't be surprised if they kept to their beliefs in secret all these years. I trust you, Herr Galen, but this just seems beyond belief. Look at. He paused for a moment, eyebrows rising. anti fascist action? No, that's really... Hitler spared no expense in rooting out every known communist in Germany. You're telling me they survived all this time? Galen shook his head. No way, my fear. I believe this to be a copycat organization. We saw find banned literature in the hands of dissident cells. I wouldn't be surprised if some more radical members of the student movement had turned to Bolshevism for some insane reason. He almost spat the sentence out, not even bothering to hide his open disgust at such treason. Spiel continued scanning the list, then his breath caught as his eyes did on the final name list. Rex Benner Schwarz Rot Gold. Speer didn't recognize the name straight away, but something about it seemed, uh, of course, the SPD paramilitary, with its fluttering tricolor and bizarre mixture of military men and well groomed politicians. Attached to the organization's brief was a name, which for reasons were well within Speer's understanding rattled him to the court. Spartacus! Speer looked up at Galen, horrified comprehension dawning on his face. He knew his history well enough to understand. Do you mean to say that we're yet to determine the significance of that moniker, mind Führer? It could be misdirection. However, yes, it is possible that means exactly what it implies. One could have heard a pin drop on the Fuhrer's office. Speer sputtered. We're, but we're trying to. I know, mine Fuhrer, interrupted Galen, grim faced yet inscrutable. But her best efforts may not have been enough. They will come, and they will be in millions. Oh, I mean, it looks nice that we got everything done here. Heard a speech? I don't want to do that one. I just don't. Uh, let's see. Anything up here? No. Anything down here? We gotta wait a few more days, perhaps? I'll be honest, this is just a mess of a campaign, man. Just a mess. Recruit. Come on. Recruit. Uh, one, two. Oh, 13 guys. A dinner with the giants. Gentlemen, a toast. Glasses clinked together as Erhard let a chuckle. Then, from the group of five, it was the most powerful Verwerschaftsführer, Hermann Josef Abs, who spoke. Say then, Herr Erhard, he began, cutting into his finely made stick. The tide turned strongly, doesn't it? In just a few short years, we've gone from an old Fuhrer to something fresh and exciting. Another Friedrich Flick, the Verwerschaftsführer. Of Daniel Benz shot him a glance, but Abs merely ignored it. Ah, uh, oh, Erhard began, downing a shot glass. I agree. I like our new direction, of course. Now, if I may call to attention why I brought you all here in the first place, all eyes land on Erhard, from Abs to Flick to the silent Edmund Geilenberg and the curious Ernst von Siemens. As you're aware, the Speer administration will be doing a multitude of things, reforming the army, strengthening the economy, loosening up diplomacy, and maybe relaxing a few layers of old laws here and there. That's all well and good, but my personal interest lies in the problem that has faced Germany for decades. I'm sure you know what that is. The air seemed to be still around them. Geilenberg spoke first. I will hazard a guess that this is about the slaves, he bluntly stated, and Ehad's smile merely grew. Correct, my friend, all of your companies. Ob's steady supply of smoke from his cigar stopped. Well, to make it easy to understand, they're going to be dismantled. The group collectively tensed up, and while Siemens was the last, least tense, Flick seemed like he was on the verge of rage. I know I should have come here, he shouted, kicking away his chair and standing up. This folly of ruining my business, Erhard. I won't let you take away a percentage of my workforce, not when I have anything to say about it. Erhard took a single puff of his own cigar and rushed it into the tray. Leaning forward, he grinned, and the rest remained deathly quiet as he spoke. Trust me, you won't get the chance to. And let us conclude this episode, because I need to take a break from this. Holy crap. Uh, with Stabsitzung? Uh, we probably won't do that one. Opening the doors doesn't seem to bet across the Alps and under the rising sun. Um, I've already been told which way we should go first, so we're going to go with... Oh, well. Nua er de Wissenschaft. Very cool. As well as solve the Wehrmacht problem. And the state of the Reich. 
Oh, is it Stay of the Reich that we want to do first? Uh, Fate of Conquest, a lateral hand, under the boot. Let's do this one first. Stop, sit it's been quite some time since we assumed power, but Herr Speer still insists on doing things his way. It's worth entertaining him for now, especially since our position isn't wholly secure yet. Our illustrious Führer thinks that it's worth bringing those darn gangsters into yet another meeting, as if it'll help soothe the outrage at losing everything they've stolen in the past 30 years. I anticipate that this meeting will be a complete waste of time, but it's not significant enough to bother fighting Speer on. The corporations already know our plans are in direct opposition to their interests, so it's not giving them any ground. No matter what Obs or cronies have to say, I can at least be sure that Speer will throw his weight behind me. I'll see those criminals laid low. Oh, my name's not Ludwig Erhard. It's probably Hermann Meyer. Cartel Gazette. Well, this meeting went about as one would expect. Much wailing and gnashing of teeth, but nothing I haven't heard before. Obbs brought up the legal challenges we'd face in attempting to reform the corporations, just as I expected he would. I'm not sure the Fuhrer would have actually taken that into consideration. It's a good thing he wasn't facing the vultures alone. The world's truly run mad when men of the 20th century will declare a legal challenge against the abolition of slavery. If they want to play at legal games, I'm happy to oblige them. It's been far too long since the antitrust was common parlance in the German corporate world. With the fear of full clout behind it, the cartel gazettes will be the sword to cut the golden knot of slavery and corporate dominance. No matter what it takes, I will see these economic monstrosities torn into a thousand pieces. But I have got to end this episode here because I've got to go back and do some more things and tear out my hair some more. But if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. It does help me out. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I do want to say, if you've made it to this part of the video, I really, really appreciate that you've made it this far. It does mean a lot to me. So, and before we end here, can we do anything here yet? Yes, we can. But I hope you have a great, tremendous rest of your day.